Okay, I think we can start. Um, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Cooper Climate Coalition, welcome to the opening event of Cooper Union Climate Week 2020. My name is Sanjana Lahiri, and I'm a fourth year student in the School of Architecture at the Cooper Union. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land of the Lenape people upon which the Cooper Union stands today. Cooper Union Climate Week 2020 is a series of lectures and events addressing our shared future through the lens of global Green New Deals, environmental racism, and community action. We aim to promote curiosity, interdisciplinary dialogue, and sustained engagement with the climate crisis. Today, we will be hearing from Rania Gossen and Elisa Iturbe in conversation on the topic of carbon fictions. I'd like to thank the MIT School of Architecture and Planning for partnering with us on this event, as well as MIT's What Are We Doing Radio for streaming and archiving the event on their website. You can visit their site at wawd-radio.com. The Cooper Climate Coalition is dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone. Please note, no hate speech or offensive language of any kind will be tolerated during the program, including comments in the chat. If you do have any viewing issues, please email us at climate at cooper.edu. Ronia Gossen is an architect, geographer, and partner of Design Earth, and is currently an associate professor at the MIT School of Architecture and Planning. Her work critically frames the urban condition at the intersection of politics, aesthetics, and technological systems. Rania holds a Doctor of Design from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, a Master in Geography from the University College London, and a Bachelor of Architecture from the American University of Beirut. Rania is a founding editor of the journal New Geographies and editor-in-chief of NG2 Landscapes of Energy. Elisa Iturbe is a critic at the Yale School of Architecture, where she also coordinates the dual degree program between the YSOA and the Yale School of the Environment. She's also adjunct assistant professor at the Cooper Union. Recently, she guest edited Log 47, titled Overcoming Carbon Form, and co-wrote a book with Peter Eisenman titled Lateness. She's co-founder of the firm Outside Development, a design and research team that considers race, class, labor, and capitalism alongside form, proportion, and the production of urban fabric. Please join us tomorrow for the interdisciplinary seminars Shadow on the Land event with land artist Nicholas Gallinin at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you all for being with us today. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Rania Gossin. Thank you, Sajana, and thank you, Elisa, who's behind the mic, and the rest of the coalition. It's a great pleasure to join Elisa and uh, all of you, actually, to launch uh, Climate Week uh, 2020. So the work that I'll share briefly tonight before our conversation springs from the position that design can play a role in the way we sense, imagine, care for, and act on the earth. Uh, maybe that's where fiction is most productive if we think of fiction in its original meaning, to knead or to form up of clay, as well as more subsequent works of the imagination. So it's that simultaneous act of forming physical space and then uh, intervening in the series of representation that I'll touch on briefly uh, this evening. Fictions matter to carbon modernity. My work as a designer and educator charts how technological systems of fossil fuel energy change the earth and imagine ways of living with legacy geographies such as oil fields and landfills on a damaged planet. Despite their pervasiveness and importance, carbon systems are underexplored, in part maybe because the prevalent city-centric framing of urbanism, not dissimilar to this image from the Total Oil and Gas Advertising Company, Common Interest, maybe the prevalent city-centric framing of urbanism has relied on this designed erasure of technological geographies beyond the urban center, or what economists have come to refer to as externalities. Out of sight and out of the conventional representational toolkit of design, large swaths of the earth have remained external to disciplinary concerns and critical thoughts. This has produced the fictions of carbon modernity, of development with a big D, of imaginations of endless growth, which now, pressed by the climate crisis, uh, we need to reckon again with the scale, complexities, and interconnectedness of the planet. So what could be a descriptive machine that makes visible, critical, speculative, and public a new picture of the earth? So my work is built on the foundational idea that a geographic imagination is critical to historical situations such as this one enclosed by a crisis. And I envision a renewed planetary imagination that seeks to reclaim the earth from abstraction away from Manhattanism in a kind of a seamless flip from that previous image of Total to locate the urban periphery within the geographic extractions that lie across the earth and across the Mediterranean in this case, between the periphery of uh, the outline of Paris and that of the uh, Hassim Massoud oil and gas extraction town in the Algerian Sahara. So in both scholarly and design form, I understand my work as earth writing, from geo-earth and graphia, writing or drawing. And I draw upon geography as the means to articulate an expanded and synthetic spatial framework on notions of energy and carbon. 
I draw upon design to bring the geographic and environmental sciences down to earth, uh, to ground us in the messy and unruly specificities of the planet, and as a means to make visible and public what is and what could be. So based on my editorial work for the new geographies too, Landscapes of Energy, which was published in 2010, I've set the ground for a decade long elaboration of energy as a spatial project in which I argue that design with its capacity to articulate a critical and transcalar spatial synthesis should be at the core of the transition to low carbon energy future. In response to the prevalent abstraction of space and what has been termed in technology solutioneering, my research and writing seek to reveal how the carbon landscape is spatially organized and how its systems of extraction, production, distribution, and accumulation in turn shape the spatialization of human activities. My scholarly writings plot portraits of oil infrastructure in a descriptive geography that interweaves the material, organizational, symbolic, and political attributes of environmental externalities. Geography comes to ground in place abstract concepts such as energy and situates them firmly within the nature society dialectic. Each energy project, I argue, is simultaneously a geopolitical project and representation. So I developed this approach in my work on the Trans-Arabian Pipeline. In it, I counter the space of flows imaginary of global infrastructures to situate the transnational crude pipeline system within the spatial frictions that its deployment brought about, a series of unanticipated consequences that inevitably accompany all large-scale infrastructural projects, including here the governance of water troughs, the asphalting of the parallel service road, and the occasional oil spills in the terminal city port. I also applied later this geographic case study framework to other sites, including the research on the relocation of the Hassim Saud gas extraction town in the Sahara. So the, one of the two projects that I'd like to spend a moment on this evening is the project After Oil, in which the format of the work on the carbon landscape shifts from text-based and analytical research to incorporate visual speculative narratives. For Design Earth, fiction is a method to intervene representationally, to plot and give figurative shape to threats whose repercussions are dispersed across space and time. In struggling to give shape to toxicity in her book, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson resorted to a narrative vocabulary, the opening chapter, a Fable for Tomorrow. She introduces a town in the heart of America, and I quote, that awakes to a birdless, budless spring. This town does not actually exist, Carson concludes, but it might easily have a thousand counterparts in America or elsewhere in the world, for a grim specter has crept upon us almost unnoticed, and this imagined tragedy may easily become a stark reality we all shall know. So in After Oil, I challenge the proliferation of data charts and the prevalent hyper-real perspective rendering in contemporary renewable energy design projects. Instead, I propose an environmental aesthetics that deploys the section drawing to explicate the slow violence of the oil system and the collusion of architecture and urbanism in the creeping destruction of the earth. In contrast to the aesthetics of flow, the section drawing is a cut that describes and reveals the extractive process. It's grounded and relational. In this case, it looks at Das Island, which lies 160 kilometers off the coast of Abu Dhabi. Since the first expeditions in the region in 1953, this island has developed into a major oil and gas industrial facility where Abu Dhabi processes, stores, and exports crude pumped at offshore fields. Such exports are a mainstay to the economy and a main driver to the urbanization of Abu, Dhabi, of Abu Dhabi and its sister Emirates, Dubai, with many of the country's iconic buildings and skyscrapers built from oil wealth. This drawing from the gas crude triptych correlates architectural skyscrapers within the subsurface field of depleted reservoirs, indexing the depth and periods of extraction in relation to the increasing height of tall buildings. So you're basically looking simultaneously at the geological section and a timeline. The deeper you go, uh, the higher the building become. And the after of after oil is a race to this, to this last drop of oil in the ground. The coupled axonometric drawing suggests a typological planetary imagination, which extrapolates these specific nodes in the system to other similar sites in the global uh, carbon landscape. And it's that uh, recent carbon reform essay, which I had the pleasure of publishing in Log 47, uh, that argues that the reform of the geographic imagination is necessary for a low carbon transition. 
to both redeem carbon infrastructure from abstraction and to render spatial, material, and political all plans for energy futures. A renewed sense of public awareness of the climate crisis is now being put forward by new political actors, youth and social equity movement, climate coalitions. Act as if our house is on fire because it is, urged Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist in her speech to global leaders at the World Economic Forum in Davos in January 2019. And it's over the past year that uh, my creative practice has responded to this quest that we know what we had to know, what did we do? to act through the design process of bringing some two-dimensional drawings out to the street, such as in this example of putting, uh, lining up this 19th century street in New Orleans, uh, famously called for uh, Jean d'Arc, uh, then birthed on a twitch as a, as a heretic. So in lining up that imaginary of the city center with a coal of an earth that is on fire. And more uh, importantly and more recently in New York at the Cornell University almost a year ago now to mark the September 2019 global climate strike. The event flag the earth was both a redesigned flag of the earth that was raised on a Rand Hall and in collaboration with existing climate initiatives and groups on campus, uh, the organization of a march from the architecture department uh, to, uh, um, to the student uh, plaza in uh, Cornell before walking down to downtown Ithaca. Flag the Earth visualizes the planet's carbon budget in a series of three concentric circles around this ghosted Earth, the thickness of which is proportional to CO2 emission. The first circle of CO2 is already released into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels between 1850 and 2018. The second thin rim is the allowance before the two degrees, since the two degrees Celsius benchmark. And the third thicker uh, circle is the business as usual scenario. Should fossil fuel corporations burn all that they currently hold in their reserves? And the numbers are from the Bill McKibben uh, 2012 piece, do the math, which were uh, revised for the 2019 version. So Flag the Earth solicits the media to treat the climate crisis like the existential emergency it is and pleads university administrators to dissociate the mission of higher education from institutional investments and assets that, that are connected to the causes of climate change. Ecofeminists remind us that the term engagement implies both a design to find out more about an issue and an ethical obligation to become concerned and to act. And it's such an engagement as an educator that I'm pledged so that the mainstream media and our institutional leaders treat the climate emergency that uh, we're currently in and take the lead in terms of uh, the climate emergency. It might be a fiction that I'd like to believe in, but some of that work uh, uh, was celebrated later in early in 2020 with Cornell deciding to divest from fossil fuels. So had it been a small seeds or just a, a drop of water in the cup of the many activists that they made that possible, that work continues. And hopefully some of this year will bring uh, some good news, further good news. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. Um, so <laughs> following up on that, um, I will share my screen as well. Okay, so Carbon fictions. Um, you know, I think that uh, the question of climate change and its representation has been an essential one for quite some time. And I think until very recently, it's been so difficult to imagine the, the scale of the crisis or sort of wrap our heads around it until recently that we've been starting to have um, sort of more tangible crises that, that make it, you know, wildly visible, like the fires in California and all of the hurricanes, et cetera. But, but even so, even as these crises are starting to bring things closer to home, and even as they allow the climate crisis to be um, sort of further visualized in the imagination of the public, I think it's still a representation of climate change via its symptoms and via its outcomes. So I think there really are two tasks 
that lie before us. And I think, Vanya, you were alluding to this really already. Um, but one is to confront carbon form, um, and the other is to overcome carbon form. And by carbon form, I mean the spatial expression of our current energy paradigm, which I think for too long, the, the spatial aspect of this has avoided scrutiny and has allowed architects to practice in a way that seems like the interests of an architect are misaligned with an ecological crisis or not misaligned in a productive sense, but simply separate. Um, but I think when we start to, as um, you know, Rania was alluding to, as we start to think about this as a spatial problem, we can really see that carbon modernity is a question of territorial organization. Um, and it's a question of, of making um, or harnessing rather whole, whole areas of resources, a whole territory towards a particular end. And um, for example, in my own research right now, I've been looking at different projects of industrialization and modernity, uh, focusing not just on, on capitalism, although it's, it's essential to understand capitalism at the center of all of this, but also thinking um, at, at Soviet projects of modernization. And so um, in the ideal communist city, which is a treatise that was written by Soviet architects, they write that the development of socialist production requires and will continue to require the creation of new and ever more massive territorial industrial complexes. It is bound to recruit vast populations at selected geographical points. So this was written um, to say that this was the project and this was the thing that, that you know, the, the human society had to redirect itself towards. And so um, I think it's important to recognize carbon modernity as this massive project towards the reorganization of the world, reorienting it towards production. And I think in that sense, the, the Soviet example is very interesting because they take it on as an explicit uh, social and nation building project. Um, and so I think, of course, today it's, it's necessary to, to think differently. And so away from moving towards territorial organizations at this scale, I think we have to ask ourselves, how do we de-industrialize and how do we de-territorialize? Um, but the question is, how can a new reorganization really be undertaken without creating enormous issues around power and equity and dispossession? I think you can see uh, in, in the examples of industrialization that we have in history, a common thread of dispossession, of people being removed from their land, their means of subsisting, changing um, from direct access to their means of subsistence towards wage labor so that their work and their labor can be harnessed towards the ends of production. So, you know, the kind of harnessing that we do is it's not just harnessing energy in, in any sort of neutral sense, but it involves the, the reorganizing of social bonds um, it involves dispossession, it involves extraction, exploitation, all of these things. And so if we're on the verge of this moment where we have to fundamentally reorganize one more time, how do we not encounter um, a lot of issues around, around power there? And the, the fundamental question in my mind, or one of them, is who will reorganize? Who will reorganize society now? And I think in my mind that... Um, we have to start creating new avenues for people to reorganize themselves. And I don't mean that necessarily in a libertarian sense, in, in, in a sense of um, every person for themselves, but I think that there's enormous gap between um, public and private, between the individual and the state, because energy is not just a technology, right? It's energy capture is really an entire ecological system and it's a whole ecological landscape from which we draw. And the way in which we organize space does not follow ecological boundaries. Um, and ecological boundaries do not respect private property. Um, and yet private property draws from broad networks of, of ecology. <clears throat> and so I think when it's important to consider when we look at the parcelization of land, this act of drawing upon the surface of the earth to delineate and to separate activity to uh, harness resources in the name of production, every act of delineation um, is also an isolation from certain ecological dynamics. So uh, this is a, a map of the state of Iowa, which, which very intensely has the Jeffersonian grid um, laid upon it. 
But this map in particular, I think, is useful to see the grid juxtaposed to the river system. And you can see that there are some squares in the grid that have water and some that do not. And so the reorganization of production um, along this, this abstracted geometry that doesn't take into account ecological boundaries creates the necessity for a different system of distribution. So already this just juxtaposition of an ecological form and this form of property and distribution of, um, of space and people creates a dissonance between ecological dynamics and the, the way in which we're organizing um, our ways of life and, and our uh, productive systems. So I think that the reorganization that is needed today is not just a rearrangement of the parts, right? It's not just to say that we are going to um, have to move our homes closer to our work. It's, it's not just about making sure that uh, we have enough transit. There are more fundamental questions that involve reimagining the relationship between the parts um, and asking why certain things we imagine to be in relation in the way that we, we do. And so in some cases, we have to reimagine um, the parts themselves. So this summer, my practice, Outside Development, had the opportunity to work with a nonprofit in San Isidro. And there, uh, uh, San Isidro is in San Diego. It's in the southern part of San Diego County. And um, they're right on the border, and they are a particularly visionary organization, and they want to start a community land trust, and they want to start thinking about how a community ownership of land can provide avenues for self-sufficiency and self-determination in their community. Um, so they hired us to think with them at the very early stages about the impact that a community land trust might have on their community. Um, we're talking about um, spatial, environmental, ecological, political impact. Um, all of these aspects were conversations that we were having with them. Um, and they asked us to start to make representations um, that would help the public to imagine different social and spatial patterns, um, but also at the same time for us as architects to not just do descriptive work, but to also consider how the architecture that, that we might design for them ultimately um, would be creating the infrastructure for these kinds of new social relationships. So um, part of the, the prompt for, for the conversation today um, was this question of, of drawing and representation, right? And how we consider um, the, the role that drawing has in all of this. And I'm actually going to quickly share a different screen just to show that you know, in part of these conversations that, that we're having with this organization called Casa Familiar, we um, have produced these documents where we, we do analysis of, of the site and we look at the spatial dynamics. And I'm going through it quickly because I'm going to go back to the other slides to focus on specific drawings. Um, but, you know, the part of our work is to look at the existing fabric, look at the existing dynamics and understand how, what the formation of that uh, space has been, of what the urban structure is, to understand how people get their livelihood currently, but also what are the, you know, this is a drawing simply of the textures on the site, how much concrete is there, how much asphalt is there. Um, but then to start visualizing what the relationships might be um, between people and spaces as the community works towards a reorganization. Um, so there, part of the counter posing that I want to do today is to talk about the relationship between um, architectural modes of representation and diagramming and the work of helping the community imagine the work that they might do in the transformation. Because again, um, for us, it's really important to think about who, who will do the reorganizing. And in the end, what, what we have really been confronting with this community is that it's, it's, uh, it's the community that will, be do the re, that will do the reorganization. And so there's, there's only so much we can do and, until a point um, in proposing certain kinds of new spatial relationships, um, because in the end, it will be the people who live there who will take up the reorganization. So our question is, what role does architecture play in that, not only in, in visualizing the, the existing context, but also in trying to imagine um, what's possible. So 
if I go back to the other um, the other presentation. technical difficulty. Okay. So um, as we've moved into the later stages of the project, we, we've been considering how we can help the community itself visualize what the relationships are. So for example, here, this is a diagram that we've made, which is to start thinking through how we might organize um, some of the projects that the, the organization can undertake once the community land trust is in place, once land starts to be held in common, what are, what are the relationships that can emerge? So we can draw this diagram that separates the ownership of the home from the ownership of the land. And then we start to see the land as embodying certain potentials, right? Where you can potentially use like local labor and local materials to densify, where you can also start to think about planting as a social project that gets taken on in the community to encourage carbon sequestration and air pollution mitigation. Um, and that's always this feedback between the land itself and then networks of reciprocal labor that, I, that might emerge with the aid of this nonprofit, um, who then is able to sort of ground, become a center of gravity for these kinds of activities through being a community land trust, which means that everybody has a stake in the land itself. So trying to reconfigure what our relationship to land is, is an important question, but this, this is a diagram which in the end continues to be an abstraction. And so we've been trying to um, think about how we can produce a sort of drawing where the subject of the drawing is the subject of the architecture um, or the subject that would sort of undertake the transformation itself so that what we are drawing is the transformation um, without necessarily saying that architecture is the heart of the transformation, but rather that architecture is the, the set that you build for the, the act of the transformation itself and recognizing architecture then as central infrastructure for that. So I think these drawings, um, just to be totally candid, are still in the works. Um, we're still thinking through how we're going to represent this. Um, but Um, this, for example, is, is a drawing that we've made that is a representation of the preliminary design that we have. We have uh, sort of basic mapping for housing that they want to build on that site. Um, but taking that, taking the, you know, from our site analysis and the sort of spatial sequence that we imagine would work on the site, taking that and then representing not just the building, but the act of transformation towards common ownership through this, the meeting, right? This is a meeting where the community is, um, is, is forming the CLT or meeting about the CLT. Um, and so is this a kind of representation that can help us imagine um, what, what the overcoming of carbon form might look like and who might do the transformation, who is doing the overcoming? Um, so there's a juxtaposition, right, between the kinds of architectural representations that, that we use. So this in the development of, of the scheme is the sort of language of architectural representation that um, is, is familiar to us, right, the distribution of programs, how we might start to make site-specific adjustments, um, that turning into a mapping strategy, and we use architectural conventions to then produce mapping, understand the scale, differentiate programs, start cutting sections of specific areas of the program and start correlating different networks of shared spaces in, inside the project, et cetera. Um, and that's all one kind of drawing and one kind of thinking. Um, but in this, in this programmatic differentiation, you know, we kept coming across the fact that the fundamental act of treating space differently, treating, treating space as a common was not appearing in a drawing like this. Um, so, so we've started to produce these, these drawings that um, start to think of architecture more as a set and as a, as a backdrop for the acts of transformation themselves. So this is a, a section cut through the center of the project, which has a series of spaces that are 
it's the spine of the project. They're all spaces that are held in, in common by the community, but that offer space as um, either a space of social reproduction, shared social reproduction to ease the burden of that and to combine childcare with laundry or elderly care with certain domestic tasks such that um, the sort of care that a community needs to take of each other is facilitated, but also to recognize that um, space itself can, can be a source of, of livelihood. And I think we've seen that a lot with the pandemic and you know, having to work from home and having to recognize that space itself conditions our possibilities of work. Um, so in, in a project of, of deindustrialization, uh, we found ourselves really wondering how we can think more carefully about social bonds. And you know, on the upper levels here, you can see uh, people growing their own food. And on the lower levels, we have uh, sort of the care and maintenance of the household and the family. But you also have this network of spaces that can um, help people. Perhaps that's where you teach a Spanish class or a music class. Um, so a, a more integral understanding of how life is, is sustained and how we reproduce our own livelihood so that the space itself um, can, can uh, become a, a sort of infrastructure for these kinds of social transformations. And um, I didn't include images here of of um, the planting network, but we've been thinking that the the community land trust can really become a hub for certain networks of cooperative labor that can arise. And so the conversations we've been having with the community land trust are how does that sort of um, lead to deindustrialization by means of the community learning to become more self-sufficient with certain aspects of things. So that's the idea with the planting. Um, that's the idea with um, having spaces for education, et cetera. So in the end, um, I think our, our largest question is really about, um, you know, who, who undertakes the transition and how can we think about the role of architecture in that? And even as the, the, the complete reorientation of our social structure towards a different um, mode of life is, is fully a spatial question, um, there is also a problem with trying to figure out just where architecture situates itself within that. So I think it's just a, it's an open question and, um, you know, I don't know if there's, there's an answer. So that's, that's all I have for now. All right. Thank you both so much. Um, there's a few questions that we have in the chat, but I think I'll just start with one. Um, that came up uh, for me that uh, while you guys were talking. Um, so the question of scale is one that's um, relevant in both of your work. Um, and scale in relation to Rania and your work, you showed uh, geographic sections in which human induced infrastructure is at the scale of these geographic phenomena, such as in the case of the uh, oil mines. And Elisa, in your work, you talked about infrastructure in the sense of reorganizing or reorienting a sort of uh, social uh, network or having architecture be the stage upon which these social networks get reorganized. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the kind of disparity in, or not disparity, the difference in those two scales um, in the realm of addressing the climate crisis through uh, representation. Well, I mean, I think that it definitely has to be both. No, and, and in some ways, I. I I decided to show some of these drawings knowing that, that Rania's focus is more territorial. Um, but I, I think that we have to recognize the, the scale at which we've subjugated entire territories in the name of a particular kind of production. And so um, that to me is that two-step process of first confronting carbon form and then overcoming it. And I, I don't think we can overcome it without confronting it first and without recognizing its nature, without recognizing its scale, um, because then we'll just have the situation where we are simply building on top of carbon form, thinking that it's different, but it still has the same foundational premise of, of extraction and dispossession and, and exploitation and expropriation. You know, these, these are fundamental premises that are needed to reorganize a territory at that scale. Um, but I suppose 
yeah, for for me, there the, there is that question then of, okay, but the reorganization that needs to happen is is still at a planetary scale. So it seems to me that that's where where part of this tension lies is how can we undertake a planetary reorganization now, knowing that the planetary or reorganization that we already tried has produced all of these um, problems. Yeah, I mean the 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 planet comes back to haunt us in in carbon form in very explicit way. Carbon form was made possible because of the expansion of uh, the global oil industry to regions following wherever oil and gas happened, uh, followed geologic pockets, uh, crossed uh, boundary lines, and uh, displaced resources from one part of the world to the other. The challenge also is that of emissions, uh, uh, which as much as uh, some countries have adopted policies uh, in favor of uh, climate action, uh, the future of the planet rests on uh, planetary agreements. And maybe <laughs> it is a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big year for, <laughs> for many reasons. It's also a big year because the Paris Accord, which is imperfect in many ways, um, uh, has, a, has a future that's very fragile with the uh, upcoming uh, withdrawal of the United States one of the largest emitters from the Paris Accord the day after the next presidential election. So I think the question that um, some of the thinkers of uh, the politics of ecological thinking, I'm thinking in particular of Bruno Latour and his invitation of uh, down to earth or landing to earth is how do we think of uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, how do we think of the planet at the moment when we are asked to land and as uh, some of those that inhabit the planet are developing plans to leave it or to refuse to acknowledge that they're also grounded in the same setup of carbon emissions that we are. So I think the, uh, the imperative of the work is maybe uh, at some point uh, planetary for, for some of these reasons. It's a reminder that uh, that the, the future of, <laughs> I mean, I, I find myself repeating that, but that the, the, the project is to, uh, is to maintain an imperative for action that doesn't allow some nation states to withdraw into their national boundaries, develop territorial plans and forget that uh, their glaciers might be melting because of the same CO2 emissions that are emitted elsewhere in the world. So that, that confinement to the nation state is, is part of the challenge. It's also a, a question of, of citizenship and what it means to be a, a citizen at this moment in terms, of, in terms of action, in terms of mobilization, but in terms also of a, of a, of a project. Um, for me, it, it lands back into, uh, into a pedagogic project, maybe because that's been the ground for uh, much of my immediate action work for, for long. But the pedagogic project of, of of saying that uh, a steel pipe is a worthy subject of uh, scholarly exploration and that energy infrastructures at some point uh, weren't that sexy to be a subject of, of research have actually made it for a while under the umbrella of green. And now with the work of uh, Elisa and many others, carbon has redeemed its significance. That some of the premise is not just to yearn for other forms that are low carbon, but to look at carbon in the face both because some of its infrastructures I think we're going to have to live with for a while. They're not just going to disappear overnight. And some of their traces, uh, I know from that Trans-Arabian pipeline that I've looked at that's been decommissioned since 1975. <laughs> questions of right of way, questions of the development of the city in relationship to the infrastructure of who owns the, that corridor and what could be other imaginaries that could be projected across that region continue to be there. 50 years later. So some of these uh, lines, uh, concession lines, property lines that are embedded in the landscape will continue to impact decisions we make later on. The second reason is that um, some of these myths or stories we tell about uh, infrastructures uh, 
kind of similar in terms of a plot line. We'd like to believe they have the capacity to revolutionize the world, to only bring um, positive change. We just don't want to see the challenges that they put in front of us at, at, at first. And it's only once they're deployed that we kind of begin to contain their negative impacts here and there, uh, only to want to displace it completely in favor of something new. And I think the, the invitation is to, uh, is to uh, is to live with these creatures is to look at these creatures in the face and to accept their negative externalities and to think with their negative externalities at first that uh, that there's is you know the 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 the, the project uh, will have to reckon with values and will have to reckon with benefits and costs it's not going to be a sum zero project the question is again who makes the decision and who pays the price who where is that value being displaced i mean some of the imperative for for some of that thinking was the oma roadmap 2050 that was circulating in the early 20 in you know around 2010 or maybe it was a 20 2006 2007 and the invitation there was to think of a renewable energy infrastructure for europe now granted that to reconfigure the continent in terms of uh, of regional energy sources, it also reached out to North Africa again in kind of that cherished promise of Solaria. But then this is where the project of representations becomes tricky because North Africa is not part of the European project, will not be part of the European project of representation. Yet, yet uh, there's that tense relationship of what do you do with that many millions of square kilometers that could continue to uh, to nourish Europe. So I think it's uh, the, the, the scalar tension, both in terms of space, but also in terms of a historical project of relationships, some relationships that continue to be reproduced in other forms are things that require invitation. I think just to add one more thing to that, um, I think that the, the, the perjurance of carbon form is something that's exceedingly important. The fact that it will, it will last and we have to deal with it and we have to confront it. We cannot simply imagine that the, the next thing can simply crop up without having some sort of relation to that. But also carbon itself will remain in the atmosphere um, for a very long time. And so I, I really like the work of Holly Jean Buck, who writes about these um, carbon landscapes. And she talks about um, these large industrial projects for taking carbon dioxide out of the air. And right now, the, the people who have ownership over those projects are, are oil and gas companies because it, they use these technologies for fracking. So um, there are these, these really important contradictions in, in how we can move forward. And it's very important to um, have a, a grasp or, or a sense of, of those complexities. Otherwise, we're simply naive, you know? And, um, and so I think that the, you know, part of what Holly Buck argues is that we, you know, if we don't have a discourse for what that landscape is like, assuming that carbon form doesn't go away, that overcoming carbon form is not erasing carbon form, but, um, but rather, starting to understand that the landscape will, for the foreseeable future, be completely shaped by our relationship to an excess of carbon in the atmosphere. And so these carbon capture machines and sort of massive landscapes of, of, of industrial capture, they are a carbon form as well, in a sense. Um, so how do we think through those and how do we, again, like I think the reorientation of society and who reorganizes it, I didn't mean to suggest that it can only ever happen on the ground and locally. Um, it has to happen at, at, at all scales and it's really all disciplines and all sort of human activities have to be pulled into this project of um, deindustrialization. But instead of through a project of dispossession, and this kind of top-down project of saying, okay, we're going to try it this way. I'm going to take these million people and put them over there. Um, I think there has to be a, a much more um, layered approach that can understand the complexities of the, of the problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, just going off of 
something both of you touched on, I think, is the idea of contention or contending with what is already there. Um, in some ways, you could argue that things like capitalism, infinite growth, um, and even certain aspects of architecture are fictions, um, things like greenwashing. Um, and so how, or I guess if you guys could speak a little bit on contending with the fictions that already exist um, through speculative work. Yeah, I think that there are, you know, even there, so that's an interesting follow-up question because, um, you know, even as in, we say that all of the existing carbon form that we have currently is something that we have to contend with and confront and grapple with, I think in the same breath, there are also many basic tenets of the way that we structure society that we have to let go. And though I think the the myth of infinite growth and sort of the there are certain ideologies I think that are are the ones that we have to recognize as as central in having produced our way our like modes of, of living and our way of living. Um, but those are ones that I think we really have to um, let go. And I think when I first started writing about this one piece that was influential for me is uh, Roy Scranton, who writes about how we have to learn to die as a civilization. And um, I, I thought that, that that learning how to die is a, is a very interesting concept. And he takes it from um, the Hagakure, a, a samurai text from the 1700s. And, you know, he has his own narrative around what that means to him. But in many ways, I think it resonates with, with this question of what are the, you know, how do we grapple with some of the, the cultural forms and ideologies that drive the way that we behave? And I think in some ways we have part of the confrontation in that sense is learning how to let go. And, and again, for me, it's, it's this question of confronting carbon form first to overcome it. It's in that coupling, like in reckoning with what must remain reckoning with what must go and then the, the the overcoming but that confrontation is first but that confrontation i think isn't just you know uh accepting everything as it is i think there are some things that we cannot they're just non-negotiable anymore you know we can't continue to have an economy that cannot function without growth um that in itself is not tenable so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating question, uh, Sanjana, in, in that it opens up possibilities for answers in, in different directions. So I think one way to think about it for me is um, that these fictions are not without their own frictions. And maybe that little R there is, is you know, I've been wanting to use it since we started having our conversations a few months ago. And whenever I think of each one of these conversations, I think how much, how much we've, we've, you know, how much we've we've covered in those, but that that's what the the Trans Arabian Pipeline project wanted to do is that uh, to retell the stories of a global infrastructure, not just in the imaginary that things move and things move seamlessly, but that in their movement, the moment they encounter constituents, geography, dimensions, they have their own uh, frictional narratives, many of which remain in archives, hard to access because of. Um, limited access, limited field work, you know, these are not uh, the easiest stories to recover. But I think one way of contending with, one way of, of grounding these narratives is to actually look closely at these, uh, at these existing infrastructures and to, 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 tell, to tell their stories in a way that uh, speaks to the frictions that are um, embedded within these, within these narratives. Um, another way is, um, and that's maybe how we're, we're, we're coming at the image of uh, Manhattanism that the oil and gas company solidifies strongly, that binary of, of you know, the city and uh, extraction areas that are very solidified and kind of rigid in their, in their, in their binary, is to begin to tell, uh, is to look for another fantastic narrative machine. Uh, that could tell even more fantastic stories about uh, the, the tropes of the moment or the possibilities of the future. And maybe that's the premise of the Geo Stories book project, which I haven't you know, touched here. You've seen the after oil uh, snapshot, and that's one of the project. 
But basically what it does is that it says, can we flip some of these tropes of Manhattanisms on their head just to be able to use the power of uh, symbolism that they recruit to tell other stories that might have a different hold on, on the imagination. So speculative fiction becomes in a way uh, 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 um, the, the, the tools with which we contend with these existing uh, representations. And there's, you know, there's the pedagogic project that I'll come back to often and always. So if I think of the work we've done for the book Geographies of Trash, um, it's an invitation to engage, uh, not very dissimilar from what feminists invites us to do with acts of uh, maintenance, with values that are not always deemed worthy in urban systems, uh, but that are necessary for the maintenance and reproductions of these systems, such as you know, the, the, uh, the work on, on, on trash uh, that, that first was, was brought forth to visibility maybe by some of uh, Euclides' work in the 70s in terms of an art, feminist art practice and has continued and maybe become even more present in contemporary conversations that ask us to uh, contend with by observing the acts of maintenance, that these are not kind of a one-stop solutions, that the existence and, and reproduction of the system requires constant negotiations, constant work. And that one way to begin to contend with them is to uh, engage their, their, their biographies, not just the, you know, the switch that is necessary. But for example, if we're thinking of geoengineering, and that's, that's uh, something we're thinking of for the next Venice Biennale, how do we begin to imagine the planet after geoengineering? How do we begin to imagine living with these technologies? What kind of a sky is out there once, uh, once uh, uh, sulfur injection is in the atmosphere? What kind, of, uh, what kind of territories are we producing in that imagination? But also what, are, what is the contract that we're committing ourselves in in terms of the future? Because you know, some of this might be required in the most optimistic scenarios of, of, uh, of managing the carbon that is already up in the atmosphere. We're told that some act of uh, absorption is required in the most optimistic scenarios. So, um, so how do we begin to negotiate uh, who makes the, de the decision and where these, uh, and where these, um, uh, where these values would be de or would be decided. I mean, I can't help but think of you know the the invitation of living with the trouble by uh, Donna Haraway and the books of Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, which was edited by Anat Singh and others. And in that, you hear the invitation of uh, a long tradition of ecofeminism of uh, looking at technologies in the face, looking at costs in the face, and uh, organizing political work not on abstract ideas but on actual deployment and that's you know that's the invitation that permeates much of this work all right thank you um i think we have time for one question from the comment section and this is a question from adele uh, i'm interested in ronya and elisa's thoughts on how indigenous indigenous land repatriation overlaps spatially with national critical infrastructure Yeah, I think um, indigenous land practices are a crucial, a crucial question. Um, I think, especially right now in California, it has become so clear that the um, the loss of knowledge around, you know, how to relate to a landscape um, can have massive implications. And I think it's a place where you can really see the overlap very vividly. Um, in a very tragic way right now between um, two different relationships to land um, that humans have constructed. And the, um, I think the loss of knowledge is something that accompanied, or a certain loss of a certain kind of knowledge in the face of prioritizing as kind of technical industrial knowledge, um, I think is something that we have to contend with. And for me, in part of overcoming carbon forms, um, you know, I don't have much faith that technology is the avenue because it gets embedded within some of these discourses that are the ones that erase a different relationship to land. Um, 
you know, in, in a general sense, of course, there are technologies in, in many areas that, that we'll have to deploy. But I think the ideology around the kind of um, techno optimism and the solutionism to me is very much aligned with the kinds of land practices that have erased other, other ways of relating to space and ecology. Um, so I think that we see we see that interaction vividly, constantly, and often it's not the you know it's more of a tragic view, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean I think uh, so for 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 some of the world the establishment of global carbon infrastructure was also synonymous with the establishment of the nation state, and that's the case say for. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, from which I gave an example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where the pipeline, most of the pipeline lied. And for that, uh, the establishment of the northern boundary, for example, of the kingdom rested on the infrastructure that ran parallel to it, that allowed to take well-established company towns and reinforced, was actually the ground zero for settlement and as a national project, reinforced the settlement of uh, tribes that used to migrate previously to Iraq in search of water and then come back in the seasons. So you can read the project of the establishment of the nation state, the establishment of the northern province at this, as the top line governorate, as synonymous with the establishment of the, the carbon infrastructure in, in that part of the world. Um, for, for conversations in uh, the United States, I would think that some of the, the ground ground, the kind of the significant work has been recently around the imaginary of the North Dakota Access Pipeline and the Standing Rock. And I think if, if Adele is looking kind of for an informed view, kind of a historical reading of that, uh, the, uh, Our History of the Future by Nick Estes, E-S-T-E-S, -E is probably a, a great place to start uh, in terms of narrating uh, the episode, but also reminding us that the narrative of indigenous re resistance um, moves us away from a future apocalypse in the way we imagine climate change and situates us already within the ruins of capitalism, already within the negative externalities that uh, the narratives of access to water uh, for, for these people uh, uh, has been compromised by even an expansion of carbon form into a future. So um, uh, someone else who would have a great uh, read on it is uh, Elizabeth Povinelli. Uh, some of her work on geoontologies and the way that she carries that uh, as, a, as a collaborative product kind of art production form uh, in uh, with um, uh, indigenous uh, people from Australia but also some of the way that she conceptualizes some of these questions. So I think, you know, uh, uh, to, to ground that question in the work of, uh, in the work of uh, at least two scholars that immediately come to mind in that question. But I think that has a, it, has a, it has implications that vary depending on the history of the establishment of the nation state and the settlement project in relationship to uh, carbon modernity in that case. Great. Right. Um, thank you so much. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you both for joining us today. Um, and for anyone watching, uh, we do have a full week of events, uh, which you can look at the calendar at uh, climate.cooper.edu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank, you thank you for all that you're doing in terms of continuing yeah. the climate march. Uh, online, virtually in Climate Week, but also I see that you went on a climate hike yesterday in terms of continuing to build the coalition in physical space. Uh, I just want to kind of acknowledge uh, you and, and, and I'm super grateful for a conversation that is hosted by a climate coalition to celebrate this and by the fascinating prep work that you know, went into making it and your thoughtfulness and desire to actually bring that conversation. So thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to echo those thank yous and just really express my admiration for the Cooper Climate Coalition and all the work that you're doing. I think it's exceedingly important for our students to be active in this work um, and to be already before, you know, leaving school, grounding yourself within the political work that needs to be done, using your place in, in the school to think about how you might organize around these issues. Um, and your voices are very important. So thank you very much. <laughs>